Welcome to the Chasing Freedom Show. I'm Noah Evans, and on this show, I'm going to creatively break down real estate deals with top investors across the country to help you become closer to achieving financial freedom. Alrighty, let's get to it. What's up, guys? Today, you're in for a very special treat at the Chasing Freedom Podcast. We've got a legend in the building today, Tyler Madden. He's a GC, and we're excited to have him. What's up, brother? Thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely, man. I'm pleased to be here. I'm uh, delighted to join you guys and talk about what fuels all of us. Yeah, absolutely, man. So Tyler and I met um, a little while back. Um, we met at the, at, what was it, the New Orleans Bigger Pockets Conference? Is that where we yeah. met? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we met there and then we connected again in, in Las Vegas at another real estate meetup. Um, and then we just stayed in contact, become really good buddies. We have a lot of similar interests and I think we're aligned on the same path. So it's really fun to connect with people like that. And so for the newbies listening, and not even the newbies, but also the you know more advanced players and the people that have been in real estate for a long time, I recommend that you get out there and attend these real estate conferences. Because, man, you're my people, brother. Like, getting to be around you guys jives me up, and it gives me my motivation to keep going. So, Absolutely. And I think that's a, a highly underrated thing that people don't give enough value to is the networking component uh, of real estate investing. A lot of people get into this, and they have this – uh, solo operator mentality where it's me against the world. But I think going to these conferences lets people bring their uh, bring their barriers down, drop their walls, and actually get to know people. Mm -hmm. uh, and by doing that, I've made so many ridiculously good connections and friendships out of that um, that I'm super grateful for. And I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't gone to those things. So um, I, I appreciate that, and uh, very glad we crossed paths. Yeah, me too, man. Well, we really want to uh, dive into your story because you've got one that'll inspire a lot of people, in my opinion. Um, what's the reason why, like why real estate? Cause you, I mean, in my opinion, as I've gotten to know you, you could have done anything. So why this industry? Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. I was, uh, I was kind of going through life kind of misguided where I would take whatever opportunity came my way. I actually went to college and I have a biology and a chemistry degree. I wanted to be a doctor, uh, through the air force. I was in the air force ROTC program to go through med school. And, uh, I just thought that was something that, yeah, I might as well do that. So, um, I think you're right where I could have done a lot of things and ultimately I did do a lot of things and, and I don't want to say I wasted time, but I learned a lot and refined what it was that I really wanted out of life. Uh, and I realized what I wanted out of life was not to have to answer to other people, mm -hmm. not to have to worry about, okay, well, I'm going to get, I'm going to get 26 checks this year and I'm going to trade a majority of my life for it. Um, I found out pretty quickly that I was good with my hands when I bought my first house with my girlfriend at the time. Uh, she's my wife now, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> I found out that I was really good with my hands and I loved the idea of fixing things and making things better. And that led me to try and provide something as best as I possibly could for my wife. I wanted to give her the nicest things that I could, but I was a bartender. I wasn't yeah. making millions. I wasn't, I wasn't able to go pay people uh, to do all this sort of stuff. So my guiding principle at that point was how do I make my wife happy? That's, you know, it might sound corny, but it, it it's the absolute truth where my guiding light is providing for my, my, my wife. And now my kid, uh, we've got an 11 month old son and there's no job that I could think of that would give me satisfaction the way that working for myself gives me. Uh, the freedom uh, they accepting in real estate, the passive income, trading uh, your time for money isn't something that equates in my mind. Yeah. And you know, so something that just came up because you talked a lot about you're doing a lot of this for your wife and then now with your 11 month old son, you're probably doing even more of it for him. Um, Absolutely. it's not that we don't love our wives. Right. But I'm sure that the connection to She's children cool, is even but... deeper, but you know, <laughs> your, your son's a mini you. So that's awesome. Yeah. So it's, it, this is, it brought, it brought up an interesting thought that I had is it's like, when we work for ourselves, we're really working for our families. Absolutely. That's really what it comes Absolutely. down to. Right. Like, I feel like we should even mm -hmm. change the term. Like I, mean, I, I work for myself. No, I work for my family. That's why, I mean, yep. I'm in the same boat. I get up and even on days when I don't feel good or I don't want to do something or I don't want to be at the gym or I don't want to be at the office, I get up and I do it because I know that there's, you know, uh, my future family's relying on me. And sometimes I like to think even further out and I'm sure you do too, but like, I imagine like one day my grandkids lives will be impacted by the things I do today. And so if I don't get up and I don't push it and I don't, you know, maximize that day that I've been given, their lives could suffer. 
Absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head there. And I haven't, I haven't really heard anyone put it that way where working for yourself versus working for others, because there's not a selfish bone in any of our bodies where we're getting up and we're doing this for the wealth or the dollar in our bank account. I really don't care about that. You know, it's, it's cool when you have money, but it's cooler what that money allows uh, and the lifestyle and the freedom that that allows, not just you and not mm-hmm. your immediate uh, interests of being able to go buy this, that, and the other, but uh, for your grandkids. And there's a quote that I actually just just saw yesterday and i love it and uh it's it i'm gonna butcher it but it's by warren buffett and uh someone is sitting under a tree in the shade right now because someone previously in their generation chose to plant that tree and you and i are going through the steps of planting trees right now where we don't get the benefit of all the shade but damn it i will certainly make sure that i plant enough seeds or plant a good enough strong enough seed that my grandkids and their kids are going to be able to enjoy it yeah, absolutely, man. I think, and then ultimately, that really comes down to impact, right? I think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs are, are really heavily, are, they're really heavily driven by impact, and real estate's a, a great tool to be able to leave an impact because it's it's tangible and it extends mm-hmm. beyond the life of us as long as we take care of that asset. But <laughs> I guess it depends. I am buying like nineteen forties. <laughs> <laughs> multifamily in, in Indiana that might not last longer than me, but we'll see. <laughs> Depends on how you build it. <laughs> That's right, dude. Well, cool. You well, we, it. I want to jump into, um, I want to jump into your first deal. Do you kind of want to, you want to, you want to ask him, you know, what, I don't know, like what, what, what was your most impactful deal over the last year? Or can you, can you break down maybe even that first house that you did? Yeah, so I, I could go a couple of directions with my first deal. It was an accidental house hack where we, you know, we fixed the house that we were living in. We house hacked it to afford the uh, the remodels, all that sort of thing, and then we kept it when we bought this house. Uh, we took out a HELOC on that to help with the uh, repairs on this property, then cash out refinance. Um, so I could talk about like mo- the first accidental deal, or I could talk about the first intentional deal, which was last year when we bought uh, seven multifamily uh, units. We bought a um, million dollars worth of real estate simultaneously a fourplex and a five or a fourplex and a threeplex here in Denver. Uh, that was kind of my first foray very intentionally. It wasn't like a convenience of, Oh, I live there. I might as well fix it. It was a, uh, Hey, I'm going to borrow a boatload of money and figure out how to make this make money. You yeah. choose dealer's choice. I said, we talk about that. <laughs> right. The fiveplex and the uh, fourplex or triplex. Cool. Yeah. So uh, it was about a year ago and we literally on Friday just closed on the refinance on our, our threeplex. So we bought a threeplex and a fourplex simultaneously. We're making offers on market. I live in Denver and I invest in Denver, uh, by the way, for those uh, listeners that care about those details. So we were throwing offers left, right and center at deals here in Denver. And ultimately everyone knows there's no deals on the MLS. You can never find a deal, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we found this uh, fourplex and my my wife actually found it, found this, found an agent to list uh, or to make an offer for us. And we never even saw it in person. We we're actually in Hawaii on our baby moon. She's eight months pregnant <laughs> on our baby moon. We tour it via a choppy video uh, tour and we submit an offer while we're on the plane. We go way over asking price and we didn't get it. So our agent was like, all right, so we're looking for multifamily. I found a triplex, um, not too far away. It's under contract right now, but the agent said it's likely to drop out. And seeing as how you went in so strong on that fourplex, I've convinced them to, if you go in with the same terms, to fall out of escrow on that one and uh, take on take on you guys. I was like, I don't really want, I want the other property. Yeah. I was like, yeah, whatever, we need something. So both of these were on the MLS, mind you. So we get under contract on this threeplex. And after we get under contract, we're doing all of our due diligence, that sort of thing. Two weeks later, we get a call from the agent of the fourplex and they were like, hey, the winning offer, uh, it's not gonna work. We're we're gonna go with the next best one. Are you guys interested? And I heard that and I was like, yeah, okay. And I was like, yes, but no, how the hell am I gonna do that? And the more I thought about it, the more I got this ridiculous butterfly feeling in my stomach where I was like, can I figure this out? And I reached out to some friends because at this point I had spent a boatload of time investing in my mindset and investing in theory, but not necessarily tactical yeah. things like, hey, how do you take down a million dollars worth of properties when you don't have that much uh, in your account? So I reached out to people in my uh, in my network and they were like, yeah, let's figure it out. So I got the courage and we closed on both of them. We closed on seven units simultaneously. We burred, um, we are burring both of them, but that triplex we remodeled 
entirely. Uh, I'm a general contractor. I do all the work myself. We put way more money than the property managers thought that we should. And we're, you know, they didn't see what we were trying to do. Long story short, we put $80,000 into the remodel of three units. Um, and then we just refinanced, we bought it for 397. We put 80 into it. We just refinanced it and appraised at 625. And we were able to burr out of that. It's uh, we left about $18,000 in the deal. Dude, uh, let's freaking go. That's awesome. (laughs) And that's not even the best part. So we're renting all three of them. It's right next to a major hospital complex. Um, There's four hospitals on this campus and we're renting to traveling nurses for midterm midterm rates. So um, I think market rates are about $1,200 per unit. We're getting about two thousand per unit. Wow! So, so oh my even, gosh! <laughs> let's unpack that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got We got. We got to go back here a little bit. So first, okay. Don't let me forget that I want to talk about your creative strategy there on the on the mm-hmm. rents and what you mm-hmm. went after in location and everything like that. That's mm-hmm. super important. But I, 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 we need to start a little earlier, and we need to talk about the mindset that it took for you to be like, and, and then also the how. We need to go into the how of yep. like. Okay, you knew you were going to buy one. All of a sudden, you had the opportunity to buy two. And then all, you had the confidence to be like, no, I can figure it out. We can do it. Let's do it, yeah. right? I mean, that's like, that's all business is, is being mm-hmm. solutions oriented because the average person would have sat there and like, nah, obviously, I can't do both. Mm-hmm. Well, the minute you say, obviously, yep. you can't do both, guess what? You're, you're dang right. You can't do both. Absolutely. Whether you believe it or you don't, it's true. I think that's one of the most important things. And, and that's why I focus so much on mindset is because until you believe that you can do that thing, you never will. And, and that's the one thing that keeps everybody who hasn't done a deal or isn't doing a deal uh, from doing it. If you can't get past that mental block, you're never going to do it. So uh, it was actually a really short process for me to be able to convince myself that I was able to, because I talked to some relatively successful, uh, I'll say very successful real estate agent or uh, real estate investors. And I asked them, I was like, how the hell do you do this? <laughs> I worked on the theory, not the tactics. And, uh, and they were like, well, let me, let me reach out to some other people. And just the fact that immediately after them hearing it, they weren't like, well, shit, how are you going to do that? They were like, let's find a solution. And I was like, oh, if they think that way, then I have to think that way. Yeah. Um, and it was at that point where even before I had all the answers, I, was, I said, yeah, let's get it under contract. We'll figure it out. So you were, you were willing to take a risk, yeah. right? Like you probably put up earnest Huge. money. You're, mm-hmm. you, you, you put up all this time and this energy and this effort and all these hopes. Um, and it paid off, which is really cool to but, see, man. And, and at so, a certain point, you have to bet on yourself. And absolutely. if you're not willing to do that, then you're not going to find the success that, that you think you want. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think you hit a, you hit it, you hit it right on the nail right there. So what exactly happened for you to be able to take down these deals? What did it look like when you reached out to your mentors? You didn't just go, Oh, you guys got to help me. I'm sure. Yeah. That's, uh, that, no, that's probably what you did. Right. You just said, you guys got to help me. Can I have some money? That's, that's probably how I, that went. Right. I threw, I threw my hands up and I said, you know, do it for me. Mm-hmm. Um, no, the, the very first question that I asked was, I, I said literally that it was, I was in a mastermind at the time and I reached out to uh, the people that were leading the, um, the mastermind. And I said, Hey, we've covered a lot of ground in terms of how to believe in yourself and how to be confident and how to, how to get to that point. But I said, I, I don't know how to do this exactly. Uh, how would you approach a situation with, with two properties like that? And they didn't, they didn't respond the way that I expected them to. I expected, Hey, maybe look into, you know, hard money or looking at, Oh, they said, let me reach out to a few people. We'll see if I can invest in it. So I didn't ask them for money. They immediately. So I think that speaks volumes to the networking aspect where it, I didn't just cold call someone. I had an existing relationship and an existing friendship that I'd spent the last you know, few months catering to. Uh, but no, I didn't. I, ultimately, I didn't take their money. Um, but it just, again, proved to me that, OK, well, if they're willing to, then other people will be willing to lend me money on uh, on properties like this. So, yeah, they didn't provide a solution in any way as much as they provided uh, me with the ability to see that, all right, this is, this is something that many people do and many people would be interested in. I think too, you hit something that is super, super important, especially when it comes to tying other people to your properties, whether that be through a partnership, a joint venture agreement, uh, raising private money, whatever, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. The direct ask is very harsh, right? I go, Tyler, can you give me 250 grand for this RV park that I want to buy in Tennessee? You're like, ooh, whoa, 
okay, that's a lot for me to unpack. I've got yeah. a lot of questions. I'm not sure if I yeah. want to, but instead if I go, hey, Tyler, do you know anybody at all that would potentially be interested in bringing about 250 grand to be a part of this RV park with mm -hmm. me? All of a sudden you're like, why aren't you asking me? Yeah. I want to do, I, 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 I'd love to be a part of that. Yeah. So it's, and, it's and the, I think the, the indirect ask is important. I agree. And Brandon Turner talks about that a lot where it, it breaks, uh, it breaks just that intimidation as well, where if you're nervous about asking for money and you don't want to do it directly, do it indirectly. Um, even if you don't, you know, I wasn't asking for money from the mentors that I reached out to. I literally just needed a little bit more guidance and yeah. I just wanted some words, not some money, but the fact that they offered it so quickly was, uh, was pretty astounding to me, honestly. And I think that, you know, I haven't done partnerships or joint ventures or anything like that. I used hard money to buy these, but I feel like when I do get to that point, it's, uh, that's going to stick around, uh, that lesson that I learned where, Hey, you don't have to ask them directly for them to want to help. Yeah. Uh, just be top of mind. No, absolutely, man. Okay. So what ended up happening? Like what, give us the structure of how this came of how you successfully closed it. Cause like we know yep. that you did, we know the, we know the back end outcome, but like what happened for you to actually close these deals? So fortunately, um, our two primary properties, my prior uh, single family home and the current house that I'm living in, we've got HELOCs on both of those. I've fixed them up. They're both gorgeous and they're both worth a boatload of money in the Denver market. Um, I was able to do that in a smart way. And um, those HELOCs helped us quite a bit because we ended up going with hard money on both properties. So we borrowed 80% of the cost of both properties. Uh, and we'll use, we'll use round numbers. Um, it was a million dollars, it was like $997,000 for both properties. So we borrowed $800,000. Um, and then we had to have a minimum of 10% of our own funds in. Uh, so obviously 80 and 10 makes 90. I still need 10%. Um, so figuring out with hard money lender, how far they'll let us go. How can we push the envelope? How do, how do we get creative? I said, I don't want to bring 20% for both properties. So they said, you can go find a second and, you know, get gap funding. Um, but we, we need to be first, uh, and then, you know, find some of us comfortable with that. So I reached out to my network to find the other 10%. Um, so we did 80%, uh, hard money, 10% private money, 10% personal funds, and we covered the rehab, um, on both properties, uh, well on one property and we borrowed money for the other one. So ultimately we were into this for over, $250,000 out of our own pocket. But fortunately that didn't come out of my bank account. That was a HELOC, uh, that was two HELOCs. So we we're super strategic about having capital uh, without necessarily having to have it directly out of our out of our savings account. So I can't speak highly enough of accessing equity uh, out, of your, out of your property. And we've used those HELOCs multiple times and we will continue to, I just paid them off. Um, so that was the long winded answer, sorry. No, that's exactly what I was hoping to pull out of you because Perfect. for someone else, I think, what I, I guess what I hope other investors see in that is the foundation that you set for yourself to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will focus simply on the fact that you bought a million dollars worth of property and now you own seven units in the Denver area and they'll go, Oh my God, I, I could never be like Tyler. Like I'm, ne I'm never going to be able to do that. Well, hold on, go backwards. Tyler mm -hmm. didn't just start there. Right. You started with a house that turned into an accidental house hack. Then you did another yep. one. You increased the value on those properties and yeah, they're one at a time. Sure, those deals yep. took a whole lot longer to increase your net worth and, and, and you know, uh, your ability to go do other deals. But then all of a sudden, you hit that hockey stick, right? You went yes. from one single family yes. house, two single family houses. You know, what is that, nine units altogether at that point? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it happened really quick, right? I mean, it happened yep. really quick on this time scale because you jumped up seven at once, but you had the right foundation first. And that's what a lot of people fail to appreciate about this process is can you get started right away and really hit the you know hit the ground running and succeed quickly yeah but do a lot of people put in a lot of work and not experience the fruits of their labor right away absolutely i mean i bought that first house in 2013 uh and we lived in it for four years and then i lived in this house for four years or three years uh at that point so obviously yeah there was a lot of not instant gratification. And then, you know, people look and are like, Oh, it must be nice. Uh, but you, you really, uh, I, I think establishing that this is not always a quick game. It's, uh, it's not for the faint of heart that are looking to just get in, get out, make their millions. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you plant those seeds and, you know, to our conversation earlier, I think I'm, I'm enjoying a little bit of shade from those seeds that I planted seven years ago. 
uh, finally, and they're going to continue to grow and, and create. But yeah, that hockey stick, uh, I'm excited to see where it goes next because uh, now the I think the the chains are off where we get to have fun. Yeah, I love that, man. Well, I appreciate the deal deep dive there. Um, of course. One of the things that I've been wanting to pick your brain on that I think will bring a lot of value is kind of what you're doing right now inside of your GC business. I know you've been scaling it and growing it. Um, and you're doing it in some specific ways that really align with how I grew and scaled, you know, my flip operations here in Boise. Um, and so I wanted, I wanted to see if you could share with the guests and break that down and kind of yeah. the impact that you're having there. Yeah. So my business, um, so I'm not a, a full-time, um, real estate investor where that's my only gig. I'm a licensed general contractor and I've got a high-end luxury remodeling company. We do uh, high-end flip or not flips, high-end, uh, remodels for homeowner clients. So I don't work with, uh, investors. I don't do their flips. I don't do any of that. It's all homeowner focused. Um, so I've gained an appreciation for doing things excellently. And I believe in the, the philosophy of, of how you do anything is how you do everything. And that's kind of present across the board in my business, in my personal life, and in all aspects. Um, so I attract a lot of people that that might not be able to do that at their current businesses, because as you know, in construction, not a lot of people live by quality. They mm -hmm. live by profit and they live by how quickly can we get it done? And that's not my jam. Um, so I've attracted some people that really want to believe in that but I've also attracted a lot of people that want to get into real estate investing uh, because obviously I've, I've kind of got this uh, two headed monster where personally I've been investing in real estate and sharing that process. And then professionally I'm doing these, these remodels. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going through the process of unifying those two things where I can continue attracting people that want to get into real estate, but also benefit the construction. So I'd like to start investing in larger multifamily properties through the business and give my employees an opportunity to find passive income and be part of that uh, instead of just hiring people and then having them go find their own side hustle where they're like, Oh, I got to go flip a house on nights and weekends while I'm not working with you. I, I want to be a one-stop shop where I can provide some of the same benefits that I'm appreciating right now um, from my investments. Um, so, you know, unraveling that ball of yarn right now with how to achieve that and, and the uh, specifics of how to do that. But I think there's a huge opportunity to involve employees with the real estate investing uh, instead of just, a, you know, an equity share or a, totally. uh, something like that, where they can actually get or maybe, you know, if you're going to go invest your money, invest it in our deals. And then so I, I think it could be a one stop shop for uh, for employees. And, you know, I, I really focus on finding the right kind of people, uh, as I know you do. And I think, uh, you know, growth sometimes can't be super duper fast if you're focused on uh, doing it right. And that's that's where we're focused right now. Yeah. And I think that's a that's a huge struggle, right? Like I've realized I've made a ton of mistakes over the last year, not in terms of like my internal team members, um, but in terms of my external team members, a lot of times I just because it's, it's external. So you're like, it doesn't really matter, right? Like a bookkeeper. Yeah. You're like, eh, I just got to hire yeah. the, the, the first one. But man, how much more pain that's caused me because I didn't take the time to slow mm -hmm. down, to really interview, to make sure that even the external people fit what we do. Because Absolutely. internally, we're internally my, you know, my team's really strong. Um, we have similar values. We all love working together. We laugh a lot. I mean, Justin probably disagrees, but just agree <laughs> on the podcast. Say, say it's true. It's absolutely true. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but dude, let's, let's spitball for, let's spitball for, for a second here. What, what could that look like? Like, let's throw some, throw some ideas out there. And, you know, for the listeners too, if you guys have ideas or if you've worked at companies that you've loved that have involved you in their growth and success, you know, we'd love to hear from you too. Um, but I mean, what, what are some of the ways you were thinking about doing that? So I think it's kind of tricky depending on size and scale of business. I think a lot of businesses start out the way that we're talking about, where you want to make sure that that culture is, is just right. You want to make sure that there's alignment with everyone that you work with. No, I, I think smaller companies oftentimes try to start the exact way that we are trying to build our businesses, where culture is the most important thing and having a good fit where they can get behind a, a vision instead of just, you know, asses in seats. I need people to do things. Um, I think a lot of companies do start with the right intentions, but then the business gets ready to grow faster than you might be prepared. And then it just becomes a matter of, I do need asses in seats because we have people that we need to, uh, you know, houses that we need to flip or clients that we need to serve and we can't do it alone. So um, that's where I'm really focused of trying to manage the scale of my business. Honestly, it wants to grow faster than I'm comfortable and I don't want to let it 
turn into something I never intended. And I think the wrong people in the wrong seats is an easy way for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think just, you know, managing the speed, excuse me, the speed at which you allow your business to grow, um, and be prepared for it if you're going to let it grow wildly. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, let's, let's go into like, what, what does it look like to try to add some type of profit sharing thing for your employees or allow them to invest in the deals? Cause I've thought a lot about this. Um, and it, it could be really impactful, but I feel like too, you, you've got to be really careful about how you do it, you know? Absolutely. And, and I don't have the exact answer on that right now. Like I said, there's still a whole ball of yarn that I need to unravel to figure out how to do, uh, how to do that tactically and give them, you know, something that drives them, motivates them and, you know, fuels them to want to continue doing it. Um, I, I think it's super important to give people the benefits that I'm enjoying uh, instead of just enjoying the work that they're, you know, that they're doing. And I get all the benefits that that to me has never been something I'm comfortable with where, mm-hmm. oh, I'm just going to work you guys to the bone. Uh, and then I'm just going to be the guy sitting, you know, high on the horse or fat on the hog, whatever they say, something about farm animals and <laughs> Uh, but that, that doesn't work for me. I need to, I need to share that, uh, with them. And I'm super passionate about being able to do that and the exact hows are to be determined. Yeah. I feel you there, Justin. I mean, from your perspective, what, what areas would be impactful as far as being on a team, knowing that you were going to get to be a part of, um, I think exactly what he's talking about, honestly, like allowing your employees or your, you know, your workers to be reaping the same benefits that the head guys reaping. Um, I think that's super impactful. Like me personally, you know, I work for you. I work for you. I work with you. Um, But for me to have those same benefits that you're having, it makes me excited to go to work because I'm, I, and I joined you to become financially free. Mm -hmm. And if you're allowing me to reap the benefits of you becoming financially free by being a part of deals, getting cash flow, getting equity and things like that, it just makes me want to stay with you a little bit longer. It makes me want to work harder because I know the more that, you make the more that I make, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Maybe not having a feeling is really important. Yeah. And I think that's a, an interesting concept as well of finding other people that want financial freedom and getting them to come and work for you. You're signing up not to have a long-term employee. If they have the means to live financially free and they don't need to work, you're not going to have them for forever. So it's, it's almost this tricky situation where, you know that people are going to be, you know, five to seven year employees, or, uh, you know, maybe you, you change the structure so that they're more of a partner so that they do want to stick around. It's, I think that's where it gets a little hairy in this industry specifically, um, because everyone that wants to be financial, financially free doesn't want a boss. So <laughs> how do you, how do you, how do you handle that? I think this is a really great topic. And I think one of the things that I would shed some light on there is that if you're hiring really high level team members, you can't treat them like they're below you or mm-hmm. like you're above them, right? Like I'm, mm-hmm. I, I, Justin, how, do you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, you treat, I don't know if I'm high level to you or not, but <laughs> you treat me like I'm your brother. Yeah. Like I'm a partner. You know, you come to me, you ask me, um, you know, for, for information. It's just the way that, the way that you treat me is I feel like a partnership with you. Yeah. And that it's very intentional. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I definitely don't ever want to ever make someone on my, I, mean, I don't hire low level team members. It's not worth mm-hmm. it. Right. Like I want mm-hmm. high level people that can, we can push the entire company, the entire organization up by being together. So yeah, I think, I mean, and that ties right into what you said at the beginning, which is really making sure the right people are in the right seats. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah and, and I think there's another aspect of that as well, where we assume that everyone wants exactly what we want, but I think, I think people, uh, they, they feel reward differently where some people might just want to feel appreciated where it's not all about how much money can I squeeze out of this deal? Not everyone's motivated by the same things, uh, and making sure you know what your team members are motivated by, uh, whether it's, Hey, getting a piece of the pie or whether it's just feeling valued as a team member or whether it's just providing a really great service for the business. Yeah. Um, understanding your team and providing them the, uh, however they need to be, um, treated and, and just giving them what they need. I've got, I've got something I want to dig into here and Justin, I'd love your perspective on it too. If I'm listening to this show right now, I'm saying, well, wow, cool. Good for Noah. You know, he's got Justin great and good for Tyler. He's got his, his great team members and cool. They're, they're all buddies and they like working together. How the heck do I ever find that? So maybe we could talk about some of the qualities 
that we found in, you know, our A team members that, that really help elevate the business. I mean, for me, the biggest thing with Justin, I think is his ability to be patient. Mm -hmm. Real estate, like you said, is not an instant gratification game. And we live in an instant gratification world. We get, our phone is programmed to send off notifications every so often if we're not looking at it. So we get, mm -hmm. we get a little hit, hit of dopamine every single time we get a text message or a Facebook notification. Or I, you know, I get them all the time from you where it's like, Tyler did this and Tyler did that and Tyler's better than you. And it's like, man, you know, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, I, I think it's really hard pressed, especially even in our age category too, to find someone who can be patient and understand mm -hmm. that there are great things to be reaped and great rewards ahead, but you got to play the long game. There's no such yeah. thing as short game. We've had yep. some short-term people, and they're not—they're yeah. not here with us anymore. You know, I think that's that's huge in, especially in real estate. The people that want to—they see your success right now, and they want to jump on board and expect that that happened overnight. And they want the next thing. The next thing that your vision dictates is going to happen overnight. No, the the vision takes a team that's willing to wait however long it needs to happen, instead of feeling like oh, it didn't happen immediately, so it's never going to happen. Um, I, I think that's a huge component of, uh, of team members that understand, uh, yeah, where you're trying to head, but that's not a next week objective. That's, uh, that's, uh, it's going to take time. Um, and, and I think, you know, having your, I think what it takes to find those people, and I'll tell you uh, exactly what the recipe was for me, is having a dialogue about what it is that you're seeking instead of just internally burying what your vision is, like having the um, the pride of what you're trying to seek and sharing your vision, whether that's on social media, whether that's just to your friends and family, whether it's whoever it is, uh, a quote that I love, I don't, I don't know who said it, um, but is uh, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. So if you're not willing to share what it is you're looking for or share what it is you're trying to do. So uh, for you and I, it's we're visionaries for our businesses. We're trying to get to a certain um, finish line. If you're not willing to share that vision with other people because you're embarrassed because it's too big, you're not going to attract the right people. Share that and don't worry about the people that are naysayers and you will, you will attract immediately the people that are like, hell yes, I want to be part of that journey. Uh, there's, no, there's no space for people that don't believe in it that way. So if you're not willing to share your vision, even if you haven't even scratched the surface, even if you're just getting started, share that vision to help the people that don't care about it. Yeah, you're giving me chills, man. I think that's so impactful. I mean, what do you think, Justin? What what things, if you thought about us bringing on more team members, what things would be really important for you that they must possess to be a part of the team that would that would ensure their success long term? Yeah, I think Tyler hit it spot on. I think the most important thing is vision. Mm -hmm. You know, what's their vision for the next two, three, five, ten years? And what's the company's vision for the next two, three, five, ten years? And do our visions align, right? Like the reason that I joined your team was because I was wholesaling by myself in the beginning. And that's stressful. You know, it's a lot. The one man show, I'm doing a cold calling, I'm doing a marketing, I'm doing everything, going on appointments and things like that. And when I met with you, I realized that you already got through the phase that I'm going through. Mm -hmm. And you're going to the next level. So there's no need for me to sit in this boat and, and struggle and, and try to get to where, you, where you're at now when you're already there. So I might as well team up with you because you're heading to a place where I want to head to, which is purchasing multifamily apartments. So it clicked in my head. It was like, man, you know what? I can put my ego to the side and I can partner up with this guy, <clears throat> whether it's for the next 5, 10, 15 years. It doesn't matter. But I can partner up with this guy. I can, I can get behind him. I can learn. I can, I can do whatever he needs me to do because I know that this is where he's headed and this is where I want to be. And I'm going to get there regardless now that I teamed up with him. I love that you mentioned pride, and I think that's something that gets in a lot of people, or uh, ego. Mm -hmm. uh, ego and pride, I think, get in the way of a lot of people realizing the benefit of working with others. Mm -hmm. Whether you're someone that's looking to join a team or someone that's looking to create a team, I think if you don't have the ability to set your ego aside and say, I need to be self-built, I need to do everything myself, and that's where I was for a long time until I realized this is not sustainable, and then that's when you realize you've got to go attract other rock stars, other a players players. Uh, it's, it's nothing relating to or showing how good you are or how good you aren't by joining a team or starting a team or depending on others. Uh, I think that's a huge realization that many people struggle with. So uh, kudos to you for understanding that your ego doesn't need to be in the, in the equation. 
I've got a funny story that I'll, I'm going to leave names out of it, but we, I had a, I had a, uh, acquisitions manager before Justin and this acquisitions manager, man, he could have uh, the runway that we had from the time that he started to the time that he left and the gap in between having nobody. And when Justin started the amount of money that individual would have made would have surpassed probably by four X what that person made trying to go do it out on their own. Mm-hmm. But it, they couldn't let the ego go. They let their ego get in the way. And they said that, you know, essentially to them, it was far more important that it was their team or yep. it was them leading the team than it was that they were on the team. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is I watched that person struggle for a very long time, even to the point where it's like, I know, I know Justin's financially doing better than this, uh, than this, uh, this old acquisitions manager of mine now. And he had, I mean, this other guy had six, seven months head start on Justin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just insane to see that. And I, I think that that's huge is being able to set your, your ego aside um, and being able to also think of the bigger picture too. Yeah. Like I think one of the, one of the great things about Justin is uh, he's, he thinks a lot of a bigger picture. He, he thinks more of the team than he thinks of himself. And that's huge. That'll allow us to succeed long-term. Oh, absolutely. And, and you can't and play the game much longer than everybody else. And that's the cool thing is you can't teach that. So yeah. when you find people that can adopt that philosophy, like you got to get your claws into them and, and hold them and, and hope that their mentality is something that spreads like wildfire throughout the, throughout an organization, because that's such a huge thing is where there's a team mentality. It's not a, a me. And then you guys, it's just like you said, you guys talk to each other, like your brothers, uh, you know, and, and that I think is uh, a super important and highly overlooked uh, aspect of uh, of building a business where yeah. hey not, not a lot of people get to go to work and just hang out with their friends uh and accomplish some really amazing things that's what i want yeah yeah it's, i mean and we've come into the office a lot right in the yeah. morning we're like i can't this is work this is crazy <laughs> dude i can't believe that, that this is what we do for work yeah, it's yeah. Like we still haven't got used to it yet no it's super fun man it's crazy don't don't get used to it because that's when it stops being amazing yeah, yeah. i agree man i totally agree well, brother, um, what I I kind of want to go back to something you said um, a little earlier about the mindset. I, what would you recommend to somebody getting started for 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 creating that mindset that you had, where you were confident enough to take down both of those properties at the same time? Because that's a, I mean, even taking down one of them would have been intimidating, right? Right? Like you made a big jump from single family to multifamily. And it's like, what did that pathway look like? Like what, what things were you doing on a regular basis that allowed you to have that mindset? So I invested heavily into mindset by joining masterminds where it wasn't specifically catered to real estate. It was specifically catered at, Hey, what's it take to get started in real estate? And more, more people should understand that it doesn't take money. It doesn't take connections. It doesn't take, you know, the exact know-how it takes the confidence. It takes, you're never going to know everything. You're never going to have everything. You're going to have to figure it out on the fly and you're going to have to supply the gaps uh, that you didn't know you needed. It's a lifelong process, but what you do need to get started is the confidence in yourself and your abilities. Uh, so what I was doing is I joined masterminds where I was surrounding myself with other people that were intentional about the same thing. And it was being taught by people that are very intentional about, uh, just knowing what you want, chasing what you want and knowing that you have what it takes to get it. Um, so I was in a monthly or a a weekly mastermind and I was seeing these people and it just made me realize everyone else that's doing this are relatively ordinary people and they're achieving extraordinary things because they believe they can. So the more I see that, and this kind of ties into, you know, both mindset and network, uh, the more people I saw succeeding, the more I looked at them, not to diminish anything that they're doing, but the more I looked at them and said, you're an average individual that's doing really cool shit. Uh, So that gave me more fuel to see that I could very easily see myself in their shoes. Um, So instead of treating it like, oh, I've got to wait for someone to verify that I'm capable of doing this, no one else is going to tell you that you can do it until you tell yourself you can do it. And then you prove to people that you can do it. I think, you know, I had this weird mentality where it was almost as if there was this gatekeeper, this mythical gatekeeper to my success where I needed to, I needed them to give me their blessing before I could succeed. And as soon as I realized that that's, you know, completely the backwards way of looking at it and you get whatever success you build, I just realized fortunately pretty quickly, 
uh, when both of these properties fell into my lap, uh, I realized pretty quickly, hey, there's no one here to tell me that I can do it. So I need to tell myself that I can do it. So it was a, it was a cool mental shift uh, brought about by, you know, daily practice of kind of changing who I was, because you have to become the person that's capable of doing that sort of thing. If you're not going to change anything, if you're not going to fuel your knowledge and listen to podcasts and read books and meet other people and talk about subjects and content that you were previously uncomfortable with, you're not going to change. You're just going to feel like, oh, I'm going to this, I'm going to this mindset thing. I'm, everything's going to change, not unless you put everything into practice. So, you know, daily I was, I was writing these affirmations uh, and I still do. I write, you know, 20 affirmations every day of I am and the things that I aspire to be. I am, uh, you know, a successful real estate investor. I am a present and uh, loving father. All these sort of things, I think, tie into that confidence. It's, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's, it's a daily practice of changing things that you previously did so that you can become the person that you want to become. I love that, man. I yeah. think that's super impactful if we think about it too the things that got you where you are are not the things that'll get you where you want to go right so you had to and, and it was funny mm -hmm. the whole time you were describing all that i was just envisioning like you know a caterpillar sheds it's like whatever yes. what, a cocoon is that what that's called sure. and it becomes a butterfly right so i mean and it matches that butterfly tattoo that you've got on your lower back <laughs> right? it's so symbolic that's not the only place <laughs> <laughs> totally kidding but uh yeah, I mean, that, that whole time. Or is he? Yeah, or am I? Yeah. But that whole time, that's what I was imagining, right? Like, you were shedding these old layers of yourself. You were getting rid of habits that weren't serving the purpose of developing you into the person you wanted to become, and you were placing them with new habits. And I can't remember where I learned this, but they say on average it takes like 40 days to build a, a habit. Mm -hmm. So, man, can you imagine if, if all you did was committed for 40 days to do something consistently one time a day, probably would take less than, your affirmations probably took you less than 10 minutes a day, Mm -hmm. And you do them straight for 40 days. You can literally change the outcome of your life. Absolutely. One People think step. that something astronomical has to happen for them to get to where they're going or, oh, you're just, you know, you're just blessed or lucky or whatever. No, it really doesn't take that much effort. It just takes intention, mm -hmm. intention and sticking with something. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, dude, this has been a phenomenal episode. I'm super grateful of your time coming on. Thank I, you. I'm, I'm sure that Thank the you. guests listening are super grateful as well. Um, we like to tie up the show with a, with a couple uh, questions. So the first one is actually, uh, Justin came up with this question. Do you want to throw that? Uh -oh. throw it at him? <laughs> let's see if I remember it. No, I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, let's just say you woke up tomorrow and everything that you've built was lost. Ooh. Those, you know, those nine units that you just purchased are gone. The house that you're living in, it's gone. And that house hack that you did in the beginning, that's gone as well, too. The only thing that you have is your mindset and everything that you've learned over the last 10 years in real estate. How would you get back to where you are or even Oof. to a higher perspective if you can? Let me ask, when uh, when everything is lost, do I still have my family? I was going to yeah, tell you, you, you still <laughs> going to have your son and you your still wife, have your family. Just none of yeah. your real estate. You still have your Absolutely. family. Absolutely. Uh, how would I uh, How would I get it back? I would... Uh, I would start with, you know, if I've got no money, I would start with knowing that I've got the ability to go connect with people, to network with people, to do essentially the same things that I've done, but fast track it and realize it doesn't necessarily have to go as slow. I would put other people around me doing what I wanted to do. I would prove to myself that, cool, these people are able to do it. I'm able to do it. Um, I would start making, you know, really good friendships with people in the industry, not for, you know, this is something that's important to me, not for the what's in it for me mentality, but for the sake of just having people in your corner. If you don't have a community, you feel very isolated, you feel very alone, but having people behind you is, I would say, like fuel on a fire. Mm. Um, I would, I would put people in my corner and lean on them uh, to just help inspire and motivate me. Um, and I'm sure you're looking for a tactical answer of, Hey, where are you going to get that money to get that property? Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's gotta be, it's gotta be community first. Yeah. Um, put a community of, of people doing what I want to do, uh, around me. Yeah, man. I think, I think we've asked that question like two or three times. I think that's the, that's the best answer that I've ever heard. Ooh. Yeah. Hey, thanks. I, I, I really liked it. And it's funny. Like if I think about one of the things that I enjoy the most about where I am now, it's that on a regular basis, and I know some people probably wouldn't enjoy this, but I would say on a daily basis, I have one or two 
20 to 30 minute calls from friends in the industry. Yeah. And it just gives me this like overwhelming sense of community. Yes. And I feel the most connected. I, I, I can, you know, my eyes are getting a little watery because it's emotional for me, but it's like, yep. it's, it's super fun to just have a community of people that get each other. We're all trying to aim for the same thing. We're all pushing. We all want to be the best versions of ourselves. We're all trying to not sit on our laurels. Right. <laughs> um, and it's just, it just makes it all worth it, man. But having those people think, in your corner is important. I think the cool thing about that is I bet you on those, those phone calls that you're getting, you're not just talking about deals and analysis and money. You're probably talking about like much higher level stuff, life stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know that's true for, for myself and the, the friends that I have in the industry where we might be doing the same thing, but that's just the thing that bonds us and everything else outside of that. I've had some of the deepest and best conversations with friends that are doing what I want to do where real estate's not even a factor. Um, I think I mentioned it before. We're not doing this for money in our bank account. We're not doing this to seek wealth. We're doing this because I just want to live a good life and leave something for, uh, for the future generations, finding other people that think that way. Holy shit. I can't tell you the power that that brings to your why and your driving force. Yeah. It makes you feel like it's hmm. possible. You know, when you're, oh, when yeah. you're out there and realize that you're not alone in the race, you're like, man, I got, this is my, these are my people. This is my crew. Like mm -hmm. we can run this together. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice too. like, you know, I've, I've been through some crazy ups and downs this last year and to be able to rely on some of those people and they pick up the phone and they go, Hey dude, pull your head out of the sand. Like you're still you, you still have your skill set, You yeah. still have your vision. Stop. Like get out there and go do it. What are you doing? Like, you, you, go you, no more sitting, yeah. no more sitting here feeling bad for yourself. Like get up, go. And that's just been, that's, I, that means the world to me. I, I can't place, I can't even place value on that. Everybody needs people like that in your life. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, so uh, last couple of questions that we'd like to ask. Uh, we'd like to go over what's an impactful book that you've read recently? And is there a podcast that you listen to on a regular basis that has helped get you to where you are? Yeah. Um, so an impactful book. And Noah, you know, this book, we, uh, we kind of went over this in Vegas. Um, that book still, uh, so it's, uh, it's called The Gap and the Gain. And the whole concept of that is finding gratitude instead of measuring where you started or instead of measuring where you are in your line and where you're trying to be, because frankly, you'll never you'll never be where you want to be better is is always what you're looking for. No matter if you just reach that, you're going to you're going to set your sights farther. So instead of measuring that gap, the whole philosophy is to measure where you are and where you started and to look at how far you've come. Um, so that's a, that's kind of a daily practice for me is finding gratitude. And I think it's hard for entrepreneurs who are always looking at the next thing, looking for what's more and looking to do better. And that's a super, uh, that's a toxic thing that I've had ingrained in my head for a long time is this quote, uh, good, better, best. Don't rest until your good is better and your better is best. Where at face value, it sounds amazing. And you're like, fuck yeah, do better, do more. Uh, but in practice, it actually robs you of satisfaction. It robs you of, of happiness in the moment for, you know, you're trading that for, oh, it could be better tomorrow. No, make it better today. So that one, uh, that one kind of hit me right in the, right in the soul where I'm like, well, shit, how do I, how do I make today a good day? Mm -hmm. How do I make uh, myself happy and satisfied with what I've done instead of saying, well, it didn't go perfect. Or, you know, looking at shit, looking at this triplex that, uh, you know, I, I increased the value by several hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, well, I still left $20,000 in the deal. I'm like, but what the, you know, why am I not satisfied with that sort of stuff? So that's a book that, uh, that I continually revisit because I'm trying to find satisfaction and gratitude. Um, and then what was your other question? Uh, podcast. What's my favorite yeah. poem? No, podcast. <laughs> poem, poem. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, some podcasts that uh, for me were super pivotal in my last year. I'll say the uh, Bigger Pockets uh, Real Estate Podcast, as well as the Bigger Pockets Rookie Podcast. Mm -hmm. um, both of those have been instrumental in me finding that confidence where uh, this was through 2020 and 2021, where you couldn't go meet people in person, but just hearing other people's stories of what they did, not for me to take notes and be like, I have to do exactly what they did, but just to see people are doing this and they're finding a way to succeed um, and hearing it on a high level from the bigger pockets podcast with uh, Brandon and David and hearing it on a beginner level um, from rookies uh, where Tony and Ashley are talking about it. I think having both of those uh, was just continually putting that in my ear, putting positive um, content around me instead of, you know, just listening to the serial killer podcasts where, Hey, I just want to disconnect. <laughs> like, I'm driving and I'm going to listen to something that's going to motivate me. Yeah. Uh, those two podcasts were, 
uh, super pivotal. I love that, man. I think that's huge. And it's kind of cool too, for people that don't know Tyler's story and haven't, you know, followed him on social media, Tyler, you become pretty ingrained, uh, with the host of the bigger pockets rookie show. Um, and I've seen you do a lot of stuff with him and it's been really cool to watch that man. Yeah. There's more news coming out maybe in a couple of weeks about, uh, about that, but, uh, I've had the opportunity to become pretty good friends with Ashley from the, uh, bigger pockets rookie podcast. And I think she's doing something really amazing. Uh, I know she did for me. Uh, I don't know if you guys are, uh, good with using names and shouting out, but I, I think, her presence in my formative uh, process was super, super, um, it, it just meant the world to me that someone on such a high level was willing to talk through things with me and, and help me just gain confidence. And now, you know, on a regular basis, she and I get along extremely well. We bullshit together. Uh, we're friends more than anything. And I think that that's a lesson that I'd love for people to take away where you look at these high level people and you think they're untouchable. You think that they're on this pedestal and you can't possibly uh, become friends with them. Like I have a Rolodex of people that I have, I have no reason to know other than, Hey, I just reached out to them and I was real with them. I didn't have a, what's in it for me mentality. I didn't have a, Hey, I need to be friends with you so that I can get X, Y, Z. Um, the people that I've met, I am so lucky to be able to call them friends, but it's just because I tried to be friends with them instead of tried to use them. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Everyone, everyone wants friends. You know, I, I can tell you that for, for a fact where if you reach out to some of these people, you might be surprised if you're not reaching out for, you know, your ulterior motives and you just want to be a decent human to them. You would be surprised at, uh, at what you can expect from that friendship. There's some of the most giving people in terms of their time, their energy, mm -hmm. their, their, their mental thought processes and, um, their knowledge and everything. And it's like, yeah, I agree with you that there's, that's something that's like super evident about you and you're very good at it. Good about it is you're just a genuine dude, man. Like you're not out Thank you. for anything other than you like to make people laugh. You like to make them feel good about themselves. <laughs> and, and we have a great time every time we're together, man. Yeah. So. I, I think that's, that's something that means the world to hear uh, that it's received that way because uh, I think authenticity and being genuine in everything you do, even if, you know, even if you, want to get something out of it, don't lead with that. Uh, you know, the relationships that you build, build them because you want to build them, build them because you want to add value to that relationship instead of take value from it. Um, so I'm super passionate about that. And I appreciate, uh, appreciate hearing that from you. Absolutely, brother. Well, final question, because the show's called Chasing Freedom, what's your idea of chasing freedom? Oh, uh, my idea of chasing freedom or my idea of having freedom? I would say chasing it because it's a, to yeah. me, it's a pursuit, right? Uh, the goal, the goalpost is unfortunately ever moving. So you'll probably yes. never reach it. Cause I would say at this yep. point, Tyler, you're probably not that far away from being able to actually retire, but I know mm -hmm. that you're not going to. No. So what's the idea of chasing freedom? I think that is a super loaded question and I love it because it, it forces me to be more introspective because just like that book I talked about where, you know, you're, you're always going to be chasing something. You're always going to be chasing that. So you might as well really enjoy that journey. Um, and gratitude and satisfaction are at the top of my list of figuring out how to quit forsaking today's satisfaction for tomorrow's gains that I'm seeking because yeah, I'll get those gains, but then I'll want more. Um, so chasing freedom to me, what I want it to become, maybe not what it is, because what it is right now is stressful and anxiety inducing yeah. and heavy and busy. And, uh, but I signed up for that. That's part of the journey. And I, I know that th those things are going to give me more of the life that I crave. I'm already living the life that I never dreamt I could have had 10 years ago. I'm already in the thick of that and being able to find the appreciation for it on a daily basis. Uh, and the, the gratitude for what's happening today, even the struggles, gratitude for the struggles that I'm facing, gratitude for the anxiety that I have over, you know, the client shit's not always going to be perfect, but allow yourself to be happy about the imperfect things because there's more going right than is going wrong in our lives while we chase freedom. Absolutely, brother. I love that. That was a great answer. Thanks for sharing that Thank with everybody. You. I read it on a bumper sticker. Nice. I like that, dude. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Tyler, thanks for coming on and being willing to share your wisdom with everybody on here. Dude, of course. Um, how can people reach you, brother? Uh, you could either uh, write me a letter, um, send me that, or check out my MySpace page. Um, those are both probably the top two ways that you can uh, you can reach me. You have one uh, other no, subscription I'm, that we're not talking about. 
Are we able to talk about that? Yeah, we can talk about that, dude. Yeah. Only no, man. No. <laughs> oh. um, no, I don't. I don't have that one. Uh, no, Instagram. I'm. Uh, I'm the most noisy on Instagram. I've got uh, uh, my personal page, which is more important than my business page, but I have a business page. Uh, my personal page is at Tyler Madden. Um, I would love to connect with people. Uh, it was an honor for me to come on and talk about this. Um, like I said, I was given a lot uh, from my mentors and from the people that helped me out. And I would love to be an asset to anybody that's trying to get started. Um, if my story can be beneficial to you, I don't treat it like I know everything because I don't, um, but I do know what I have done and I'm more than happy to be here with you guys sharing that. So. Thank you for uh, for giving me the platform, man. Absolutely, brother. Um, and I, and for anyone that wants to hear more from Tyler, uh, you're going to be at the bigger bigger pockets rookie conference here at the yeah. end of the month, right? Uh, what is the exact dates on that? I want to say it's the 31st. Are there 31 days in April? I don't know. I, th I think it, yeah, it's like it's it goes <laughs> it's through May 30th. 1st. Yeah, it's the uh, 30th through the first. Yeah, the 29th. Don't quote me. It's the one 29th, of those dates. the yeah. 30th well, and the 31st. It's that whole weekend. We'll throw a link in the show notes so it, uh, <laughs> anybody who wants to grab a ticket can. Uh, but yeah, and honestly, too, thanks to you and Ashley, uh, you guys invited me. And I get to hand out, I get to hand out bumper stickers, which is going to be really cool. No, Absolutely. You get it. You get to put the stamps on people's hands when they yeah, walk in. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Yeah. So if you guys want to see me, I'll be there as well. Uh, Tyler, what are you, what are you speaking about? Tell everyone what you're, uh, Oh what yeah. Going it's going to be about. fun, man. I think I get to speak on, uh, building teams, which is going to be really cool and impactful. Absolutely. So I'm excited. I, I hope we're not speaking at the same time. Cause I want to attend that one <laughs> with our luck. We probably are. <laughs> we are. We are. Cool brother. Yeah. Hey, thanks again, man. That was super fun. Likewise, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. We'll see you next time. See you, Tom. Adios. All right. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode, you guys. Um, for more awesome real estate content, you can check out my Instagram. It's just Noah Evans underscore real estate. It'll also be in the show notes. If you want to reach out to the guest, their contact information and websites and however else to get a hold of them will also be in the show notes. All of our podcast episodes get thrown up to YouTube. And for more awesome uh, exclusive content, please go check out the website. Um, we'll have that link in the show notes below as well. All right. Peace.